she helps people. I do the same thing. I just do it on the ground. And uh, you've been with Oprah for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that relationships are, are, are difficult. Reason why is because they gathered so much evidence was supposedly they gathered so many videos and laptops and also electronic devices. Friend in your head, Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, best friend forever. <laughs> yes, yeah. her, her man, Stedman Graham, uh -huh. uh, wrote a book called Identity Leadership. Okay. And in the book, he reveals some of his secrets about the 30-year relationship he's had with Oprah. Oh, this is the funniest thing, guys. You all know Stedman is really... Get ready, because what you thought was predictable is about to take a wild turn. The plot thickens, the suspense rises, and nothing is as it seems anymore. Just when you think you figured it out, bam, everything changes. This isn't your usual story. It's about to get a whole lot more intense. So stay with me because the next move is going to flip the script completely. Expect the unexpected because what's coming is going to blow your mind. Hold on because the real action is just getting started. <laughs> yes, yeah. her, her man, Stedman Graham, uh, wrote a book called Identity Leadership. Okay. And in the book, he reveals some of his secrets about the 30-year relationship he's had with Oprah. All right. And in Hollywood, like I mean, a 30-year relationship, that's like a kind of a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, especially, not years. especially with someone as powerful as Oprah. Yes. So uh, he goes on to say, the thing about our relationship is I want the best for her. So I'm dedicated to her happiness. So that's great for her, and I want her to be the best she can possibly be, and she's done a pretty good job of doing it. You hear that, Frank? You hear that? That's how you're supposed to t talk to a significant yeah. other or a spouse. You want the what's best for yes, her. You want her to be happy. That is wonderful, Stedman, uh -huh. but this yeah. is so passive-aggressive because then he goes on to say this. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. For me, I've been able to find my own happiness. Oh. Like, nobody's helping him find his happiness. He's helping Oprah find all hers. He's finding his own You're happiness. You're reading into Man. that. Oh, no, 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 no. He goes on, he, go, he goes on, he goes on. <laughs> For me, I've been able to find my own happiness and develop my own skills, my own talents, oh. my own abilities, and I'm satisfied with that. So the combination when you have a good partner that's able to self-actualize their potential and you're able to self-actualize yours, one and one equals about six. Oh! <laughs> The only thing you don't see there are the tears on this other paper. <laughs> yes. oh, it sounds like Oprah's absence made him stronger. Or maybe to make him happy, to make no. him happy, she gets home from her powerful day and, and looks at yep. him and goes, You get a BJ! You oh, get a BJ. Right. Knowing how it, how it can empower you and your ideas and where you're going and who you want to become and not be stuck in just thinking that you're all of that. You know, right, and you're not, you know, because once the once you stop playing ball, really not that many people care. Right. So you got to make for for make it work for you, and that's what social media should be doing for everybody is making it work for you, as opposed to again the reverse. So uh, you you also wrote um, teens can make it happen. Nine mm -hmm. steps to success. How does the I concept of identity differ for this younger demographic? Well, that's a great question. Uh, again, I go back to how we learn. Uh, I'm trying to get a 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old young person to understand they have 80 years left. Um, and if they could take those 80 years and learn how to learn, learn how to apply everything to what they love and what they're passionate about, what's meaningful in their life, that they really have an opportunity to improve. I mean, you're going to really be successful if you're a better person today than you were yesterday. And you just keep growing and you're learning and you're a lifelong learner and you're a reader. You keep reading all the time and you're focusing on setting goals and you understand the process of success and how it works and you're focusing on what you love you're, and you tie that to business and you tie that to social media you tie that to all those things that will empower you based on what's possible for you and you have access to a global marketplace and everything you learn from now on you can begin to organize it through a cognitive ability to be able to download content that's relevant to your talents to your skills and to, to your passion if i can get you to understand that at 10 or 11 um man that's a pretty good uh process for building and designing your own future 
Yeah, I mean, changing the trajectory of someone's life at that age, I mean, you, you can't put a price on that. I mean, it's like you said, it changes them forever and can benefit them greatly. Yeah, and the process works, especially for, you know, some athletes who are young. You know, they start at, what, six, five, and four, and they learn the process of how it works. Yeah. And by the time they get 11 or 12, they're, like, killing them. Yeah. And that's when you – and so so it's the same process for me as trying to get young people to understand their, their empowerment at an early age. So similar question to sports, you know – these young people now, I mean, I couldn't imagine kind of growing up with social media um, the way it is now back when I was a kid or a teen. Um, kind of similar question that we did for the athletes. How, how do these young people deal with social media when they can't necessarily like start a business or use it for work? Well, I, I think they have to. Uh, it's tough. The very difficult thing when you're dealing with social media and you don't know what it, what it does or the purpose of it or how it affects you and the algorithms are set up and designed to hook you, you know, and all of that. So I think you just have to, well, hopefully you have good parents who understand, you know, how to monitor some of that. But again, it's, it, it is a valuable tool because it has so much information. Again, I go back to not everybody's going to get this, but making sure you understand who you are so you can apply the information to your development and create something that that you can control as opposed to it controlling you. And so that that's an awareness process. You know, that's that's raising people's consciousness about that, which we're trying to do in, in schools. And, and, and in students, we do. I mean, we do. We have a program in Mississippi that we're working on and man those, those young people there they're in stem they're in stem programs and they're smart and boy to be able to eliminate all the labels that they have to deal with i mean through this process of identity and understanding who you are it's just really so rewarding to see them the light bulb go off and not be defined by their parents and not be defined by their circumstances which can be very difficult for them sometimes yeah, and that, I mean, that kind of answers the second question as well about, you know, how do you educate parents and educators in order to help children, you know, think more about identity first? Well, you have to have curriculum, and uh, and so you have to have the books and the content, the materials and everything else, and then it's, we set it up as a train-to-trainer program. Um, so there is... You know there are projects in there that you're doing and yeah, yeah. It's, it's the execution of this work that you spend a lot of time on how do you actually get it into um a system that you can deliver to uh, these schools and organizations you know anywhere so another great sports um kind of reference right here move without the ball put your skills and your magic to work for you the title itself move without the ball it signifies being proactive when you know the spotlight isn't necessarily on you. Can you share a personal anecdote where you felt you were without the ball and in life and how you positioned yourself strategically in order to get out of it? Well, I think when you stop playing, you know, you're first of all, as a ball player, you're used to people cheering on cheering you all the time and you're spoiled and all of that. And so Man, move without the ball for me is it's going into the service, man, and having to uh, clean latrines and, you know, with a toothbrush and all of that and really getting down and dirty around what life is uh, could be, you know, and what life was at that particular time. So uh, that was move without the ball for me. Move without the ball for me was learning business. Move without the ball for me was traveling around, seeing the world. Uh, and then the beautiful thing about move without the ball is that you know how to move with the ball, but you also know how to move without the ball. And that, that really has been my life, is, is learning how to move without the ball. And that without people, you know, clapping and yelling for you because you're making some baskets, but to be able to be be good on the court but also off the court you're just as good so that's my hope and dream uh, I think that's where Kobe was going you know mm. he's trying to be just as good off the court as he was on the court in different fields because he wasn't playing anymore uh, before it's unfortunate 
uh, mishap. Um, so I, I just, I, I think that is, that's the key for athletes because the athletes have it. You know, they have the ability to be able to do that. They can process, they're smart, all that. I don't know if they have the information a lot of times, but certainly uh, they have the wherewithal to make it happen. And then what's kind of one of the most important ways athletes can maintain a sense of self and maintain a strong identity, you know, while your society might only view them through one lens? Being able to take control of their own development, I would say be a reader, be a learner, try to focus on what you're gonna do, not while you're playing, but what you're gonna do after you stop playing. Have some game plan. So not just have a game plan for being on the court, uh, being on the field, but have some game plan for when it all ends, you know, which is really the key. So you can leverage, there's a word called leverage. You're leveraging the opportunities that you have while you're playing. You know, so to me, that's, that's very important, important. You've been waiting critical. for this and trust me, it's bigger than anything you could have imagined. The truth is about to come out and it's going to change everything you thought you knew. This isn't just any reveal, it's a game changer. The kind that will have you questioning everything. So get ready because this is the moment where everything shifts. The secrets are out and the reality, it's going to be shocking. It's on this podcast about Oprah Winfrey saying that she didn't. She started the trend of uh, not paying um, black actresses or actors properly. Did you see him say that? I saw he said that. I don't remember catching it, that she started the trend. I think he said he could have broke. She could have broke the trend by giving them. That's what it was. You're yeah. Right, you're right. But yeah, I did see it, and um, one thing I can say about Sugar, y'all know, and all of y'all. Chill with cheating people and robbing people with himself. That, that, I keep telling y'all that ain't that ain't factual. It may have eventually came out that way because uh, because of the accounting and all of that stuff and the lawsuit that y'all think Afeni had to sue, which y'all don't know her her thing was really a response to a Suge lawsuit. But uh, which which is kind of called a what a counter lawsuit or whatever. Uh, but she was very, very generous with, with money as far as giving artists uh, monies. Um, yeah, I heard I heard an interview recently with uh with 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 the dude um, uh, the one that played in the movie with Tupac in uh, Gridlock. I uh, can't think of his name right now. Ross. Who? Ross. The black guy. Oh, you know. or was it gang related? But anyway, I heard an interview where he was saying how he was offered a million dollars to sign with Death Row stuff. I'm saying all that to say Suge was very, very, very generous. Was a tone loke? Very, very uh, generous with giving people money and, and advances. Um, and so he, he's kind of right when he said he overpaid people and gave people a lot of money and stuff like that advances and stuff like that you know like i said she'll get his bad rap because he didn't have a royalty department where people can actually see how much they were really spending because we all know how we forget until we get that credit card statement and we get that statement we're like god i did spend that much money on my credit card or i did spend that much money this uh this month and you don't realize it until you see it in black and white and so that was the problem with death row and death row artists and stuff like that uh so I can't, I, I, I can't hate on Suge by saying that he didn't overpay people in the business and give people big advances, you know, or a big amount or big budgets and stuff like that, because he did. I know a lot of y'all already saying, oh, no, he didn't, he did this, or well, you don't know what you're talking about. And, 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 but I understand because nobody defended that correctly. That's what... Uh, people believe don't make it factual but I can also throw out some things to show that say you got your motherfucking nerves cause uh, there's people that has also done things for sure or done things for his company you know like the the artists 
I'm talking about the people that did the artwork or the photographers or I'll give an example uh Hindall who drew the Defro logo right if he would have did that for a major company as much as that Defro logo is being exploited now could you imagine how wealthy he would be or his um his estate would be from that logo for, for, you know just getting a little piece of whatever because he drew that and that was his thing and because he didn't do the correct paperwork or give people the correct uh licensing form or whatever to have that out so for him to call out oprah for stuff like that that he neglected to do as well it's crazy how someone would go against his own kind it's kind of hypocritical um get his point or get the point he was trying to make he went way too deep the uh, the actress and the actor's name that in the british part that he knew about i don't know how the in prison know all of this stuff <laughs> i mean he's a, reading the hell out of magazines or he talking to somebody that that's giving him some good advice because man he did a hell of a good job of breaking down those british actors and actresses and stuff like that so not gonna give my opinion too much about the acting part because i do believe and i do like hey, if you got that role i don't care if you're british or whatever if you can make the role did y'all know the idris when he was in the war when he was in the war did y'all know who he was from from the UK <laughs> when he played in that part? No, you thought he was a motherfucker with an accent that talked like a dude from Baltimore, from b -more. At least I did. When he played in those shows with Beyonce, uh, I didn't know he was, you know. So I'm saying all that to say, if you learn how to act and you act, then, you know, I don't have no problem with with you um, learning and acting. I, you know, Heron wrote Heron and Big C Style wrote uh, the treatment to uh, Murder Was The Case. That video. Did they get big checks for writing that? You know, mur you know the, the, the video for that. The, 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 you know, the scene and all of that. Were they in that video? Big C Style was, but Heron did a lot of the treatment on that. Was he in it? So I'm saying, so, you know... It's a lot of things that should say be a little kind of hypocritical, in my opinion. Um, things that he didn't live up to that I think now in 2024, he may think about and would be a hell of a better businessman um, in 2024 than he was in 1995, 1996. Even though, even though me saying all of that, as far as the independent label, Okay, Baby and them might have did well and did a little better because they have a longer run now. But other than Baby, who was better than Shug? Who? Tell me. Y'all gonna say Baby, I know. And that's just because he had a longer run because of Drake and, and Nicki and, and Lil Wayne and all of them. But 93... 92, 94, 95. I know I went backwards with numbers. Uh, 96, but nobody better executive in the music. Not Russell and Lior. They didn't start hitting run, home runs until 98, 99 again. They were bankrupt. They had to go and sell part, part of their company to Columbia to save them. And then they started back again with Method Man, Red Man, Jay-Z, DMX. Thank God DMX saved them. But y'all say Warren G saved them. I say it was Montel Jordan. With, this is how we do it. Y'all remember that song? No, y'all don't remember it. But that's what saved Def Jam. But they, even after that, they still weren't doing good. Because I shot the sheriff, didn't do it. <laughs> but anyway. So, that would be my take on that. I said I wasn't going to on Chug Knight no more and all of that, but oh well. Call a ball a ball. Strike a strike. <laughs> Baseball season almost back.
us. Because mm. they not like us. Mm. They wish they were. See, you keep diluting the greatness of a people and what you'll have is a shadow of what it was ever meant to be. All of the, this gay agenda has to stop. To be homosexual is one thing. To be a gay person is fine. But to use it to manipulate and brainwash society for um, the purpose of population control or class control, caste system domination, that's not what, that shouldn't be. Yeah. It shouldn't be. Isn't that just being inclusive? Like, hey, we're trying to include everybody into oh. our agenda. No, and it's not being inclusive. What it is, is it's being covertly domineering. Mm. Mm. Okay. It's funny because they say Disney has an agenda. And you're like, mean? I mean, well, Haven't you, 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 ever you heard me talk about wait, wait, Lady in the Tree. Right, right. We, I heard it. And, and you see it. Like, they really show it. Like, as a matter of fact, is this movie have an agenda? No, add that agenda in there because we need to yeah. make sure. I'm like, damn, this is so. Uh, uh, like all these gay men singing all of these women all of these love songs to women even though they suck as soon as they finish getting off stage like just let him sing to his boyfriend let him write his song that's the one thing that i loved about sid from the internet she didn't fake the funk that album ego death sid wrote her ass and she wrote it as a bisexual stud woman who is now a full-on lesbian stud and married if i'm correct in a relationship and i said to myself how dope is it that these stud women they now have songs that were made for them yeah. you know what i mean they don't have to replace girl with boy in the love song that they like because it was actually written for them yeah. that makes it amazing and yet they tank the internet over her goddamn career because she didn't want to conform and now apparently she's only good enough ghostwriting for Beyonce. I mean, can you have a bunch of Frank o Frank Oceans out there? Can you have like where the there world are is a bunch of Frank Oceans out there? You are? There You're are right. There are a bunch of Jaguar rights out there. You're right. There are a bunch of proofs out there. Mm. There are a bunch of Nazis out there. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta rise to the forefront. Yeah. Uh, Jen, let me ask you about uh, Divorce in the Black. Tyler Perry's latest movie has Worst been. Worst movie ever. Yeah, God. It, 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 Humiliation ritual. Yeah, in the first eight minutes, just what the f I mean, if anyone thought about us in some kind of way, that's to, to show that, to put that in. Tyler a Perry has been making black people look like buffoons and idiots for years. And. Um, pointing it off as culture oh it is our culture this is how we is no that's not how we is because i don't know no fat skinny medium-sized woman that would strip down ass naked in a church at a funeral and say that no nah, that doesn't happen that's not real yeah. the whole falling out the casket and dragging out the casket yes i've seen that yes in real life but um no ain't no f uh no no, she gets teased enough. That's enough. She ain't taking her clothes up. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. And what it looked like was poor. What it also looked like was, so you take the good preacher's girl and put her with the bad boy. And then, you know, he treats her like forever. And then she finally gets the courage to somebody else. And then she acts tough for five minutes. And, you know, like, I'm, I'm still trying to understand the whole purpose of this. Like he was supposed to be so explosive and so dangerous, yet he got put to sleep like four or five times in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Like he was so tough, <laughs> but he went to sleep real fast. Yeah, real like his brother and him got he's like, ah! Go, go, go to sleep. Go to sleep. I'll put him in the car <laughs> so you can get him home. Yeah. Then the boyfriend. Yeah, it, it, the boyfriend is dead. Go, go, go to sleep. <laughs> Back to sleep again. God damn! I, yeah, yeah. Keep your ass in the car. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, so what do you feel happened to Black Hollywood to where it used to be an event to put out a black movie? Tyler Perry happened to Black Hollywood, and he did it by using 
stupid, ignorant, so-called Christian to fund all of his very homosexual behavior. He ain't Richard Smallwood. He's a whole cross dressing weirdo. Hmm. Let's just be honest. It was black American churches that made Tyler Perry rich. They went to all his plays. Like Tyler Perry plays started in the churches. And he took all of that money and hustled that money and hustled that money and hustled that money into the television shows. And yet, how many churches does he donate to? Because the only one I've ever seen him donate to was um, TV Power Bottoms Jake Church. Hey. And they both attended the freak offs, you know, as brethren. Hey. Ah. Amen. Push the baby out. Oh, okay, okay. Um, okay, okay. That's what happened to Black Hollywood. They allowed the Wayans to become gatekeepers and move people like Robert Townsend out of the way. That's what happened to Black Hollywood. Mm. They let... <sighs> Did anybody just see Roseanne on her podcast talking to Dave Chappelle's co-star from Half-Baked? I didn't, I didn't get to see it, but... You should watch it. I'm gonna watch that. And how he said Dave got visited and he was there the day that they came and told him. And the next thing you know, he said he went to Africa and he ain't been the same since he came back. Oh, I did see that, yeah. He said he was there the day that happened. And I'm gonna tell you something right now. From the second that I saw Dave Chappelle on SNL doing shush, shush to Kanye West, I wondered too. Just like I still wonder about Kevin Hart. Right. And why I haven't seen my friend 40 since he's been in that accident. Mm. Yeah, Invasion he, of the body snatchers. Yeah, he said he said uh he said a different man came back and he knew Dave well, very well. And a different man came back. Yeah. And guess what? Kevin Hart never sat around getting drunk all the time. He's drunk all the time now. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, he does drink for his podcast, you know. No, like, oh. he's drunk all the time. Wasted drunk from what I'm hearing. <sighs> Wasted drunk. That was never his. And he's not that big a drinker for real for real. Okay. His brother drinks. Mm. 50 keep up. I mean, 40, yeah. 40, 40 drink. Mm. So, Jack, he's last. He's starting to act a lot like his brother. Mm. And he's starting to act a lot like a fan. So if you thought the best days were behind us, get ready to be proven wrong. The comeback is real and it's going to blow everyone away. Stay tuned. This is just the beginning. So if it's extreme ignorance, if it's watered down uh, blackness, if it's uh, whiteness that represents uh, being able to be cool and be accepted by black people, whatever it is, we want more of that. So we will do everything in our power to make this person pop off and be a star to push this agenda. Or we have a vested interest financially in seeing this artist make it. Cause not only do we have this artist signed to us, but we manage this artist and we know that this artist is gonna create a whole generation of people just like them. Yeah, they definitely got industry plans. Yes, all, all, all of these black artists who ain't even old enough to understand the contract that they about to sign and who are being signed just because they had one thing that went viral that they glorifying a bunch of murder and a bunch of just negativity and all of a sudden they about to get paid millions of dollars those are industry plants the industry knows the impact that those artists will have on the rest of their community they know it and they're just like oh man we, we need that person to make it for sure but if you are representing something positive or something righteous or something intellectual or godly you absolutely have to do way more work to make the industry say all right we're gonna let him in it's like all right we're gonna let a j cole in we're gonna let a kendrick lamar in but op, 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 we got enough we got enough of them you know what i'm saying we got enough of them you realize that j cole and kendrick lamar are two of the richest rappers walking planet earth today two of the most successful rappers why would the industry not want 
more J. Cole's and more Kendrick Lamar's. Yeah, they don't even floss or anything, bro. You don't see them with jewelry, none of that shit. Yeah. Bro, J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar scare the industry because if they let more of them in, you're gonna have a whole generation of people coming up who are black, who are saying, I ain't even got to flaunt no jewelry, you hear me? I ain't even got to flaunt fancy cars and I can be intellectual, I can be woke, I can be a man of God. Or rap about it. Or rap about that stuff. And if you got a whole generation of black people that's coming up, that's like, man, there wasn't one J. Cole and one Kendrick Lamar. There were a ton of them and they were all huge. Now keep in mind, a ton of people exist who are doing the same type of work that Cole and Kendrick are doing. And they're doing that work in their own way. I'm one of the people, you know? And there's a bunch of people that are doing that. But for the mainstream music industry, man, they don't want a bunch of that to exist, bro. Like, it doesn't make sense why you wouldn't want more of that. Because these dudes ain't never been to jail. You ain't got to worry about, oh, uh, we might sign him and he might go to jail. And we can't even put no music out. These dudes ain't never been in no shootouts or nothing like that. Why would the industry not want more of that? Think about it. Think about it. You right, you right, man. That's a real talk, yeah. Come on, man. You, you, you mean to tell me you not a headache? And and you still gonna make buku bread for us and for yourself and just like everything is all good? Like like people entertained by you, they love you, da-da-da. You mean to tell me they wouldn't be like, man, we need more of that. But come on, bro. Come on, bro. Every year, they're like, yo, who is the new street rapper that need to get signed and get pushed out there not in one city but in every major city every year it's like man who is the new street rapper that we could sign that's gonna impact the masses in their city and we gonna blow them up and they young so they don't realize that they being used right now you heard me they don't realize it we're gonna make them rich and we're gonna get one from every major city because that way we can make sure that they give birth to a whole bunch of mini me's that's looking up to them and it's up to the older artists who know better and who understand this to say, man, I gotta get in the ear of that youngin' right there. Cause the industry is hot on them right now. The industry ready to use them and ready to prostitute them. So as an OG, I gotta make sure I get their ear as well and tell them, hey, don't let them people make you crash out. That's why we need real OGs in hip hop. But we got DGs a lot of times. A DG is a disappointing grown up. And that's what we got. That's what we got a lot of in hip hop, bro. We don't got OGs who really want to get the air of them youngins, man. So that's, that's dog, dog, like, that's, that's tough. Yeah, that's wild, man. Cause I was wondering for a while, man, like how do they find these rappers to push this, you know, agenda? But, um, you know, you pretty much gave me the answer, man. Um, It gotta be somebody that's desperate. It gotta be somebody that wants fame and money more than they want to push a message and has morals and integrity. So they find those people who are willing to prostitute their services and they take them and they say, cool, we got exactly what you need. Uh, we got a platform and we got some paper. So come on, you just got to do our work. That's how they find them. And in the music industry, uh, you got so many people that rap nowadays. More people want to be rappers than basketball players nowadays. More people want to be rappers than any other job, teachers, uh, electricians, welders, doctors, lawyers, accountants. So since people want to be rappers, we have to be able to understand what's happening. They're just looking for, man, who is desperate? Do you have to be talented to make it nowadays and be an industry plant? No, man, you don't have to be talented. They can get you the beats, the best beats in the world. They can get you the beats. They can put the hook on the song for you if they want to just give you the hook and they could be like, just rap. And then we could put millions of dollars of promotion behind you as well. They can do this type of stuff. They have the power to do that. So we have to have the power to resist, bro. And that's all I'm trying to do, uh, brother. You hear me? All I'm trying to do is wake up artists to where we see what's going on and to where we like, man, for once in history, we're going to come together and say we don't want to be part of this manipulation that's going on. And for fans to say, we are going to do what is very hard and very revolutionary, and we are going to resist what's being pushed on us. And we're going to go ahead on and say, take me to Whole Foods instead of McDonald's. There's a whole lot more McDonald's available in my hood 
13,000 of them in the United States. It's only 516 Whole Foods. So you got to work harder and you got to look harder if you want to go to Whole Foods. But let me take that because that's going to be better for me in the long run than all this McDonald's. And that's what we got, bro. You know, um, um, to answer your question earlier, because that was a great question, bro, about the legends. At this point in hip hop, we need to take legendary status away from 95% of the people who we consider to be legends. These dudes ain't no legends, man. They are legends of doing the devil's work. They are legends of pushing evil, negativity, white supremacy. They are legends at that. But if we want to talk about just legends for what they have added to humanity in a good way, we got to take legendary status away from 95% of these dudes. And then we got to have a new criteria. Because we just think, oh, you a legend because you sold a lot of records. We a legend because I grew up on y'all. Da, da, da. Man, I'm thinking about my city. I'm thinking about New Orleans. So many of the people that we call legends in New Orleans, it's like, what are they really legends of? Like, what did they represent? You know, if, if, the, if, the, if the main thing you represented was get money, that mean you a legend? You know, if the main thing you represented was, um, yeah, murdering people, you know, like what? And trust me, you won't believe what happens next. Keepers in hip hop? Gatekeepers in the music industry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, depending on what part of the industry you're trying to get access to, there's gatekeepers. So if you're trying to get signed to a major label, there's gatekeepers. If you're trying to get on certain media platforms to get interviewed, there's gatekeepers. If you're trying to get on the mainstream radio, you heard me, urban radio, there's gatekeepers. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I will say one last thing about gatekeepers. Uh, the only true gatekeeper to what's meant for you in this world is God and your level of integrity. That's the only two gatekeepers because what's meant for you and what you want, that's two different things. And a lot of times people end up wanting things that ain't of God. And now if you want something that ain't of God, you gotta go through gatekeepers. So I'd rather go through God than go through gatekeepers any day. So all these people, all the times that I have encountered these gatekeepers in the industry and I'm knowing I'm overqualified for something, but I got somebody telling me I'm not good enough or I'm not enough for this or I'm not paying enough for that, da, da, da. I had to learn through maturity that that wasn't of God. You feel me? And that's what you got to check. Do you have godly ambition or do you have selfish ambition? And in this world, it's very easy to have selfish ambition and that'll take you on a pathway to where you're going through all these gatekeepers who really ain't nobody in, in the big scheme of things on the totem pole of people with integrity and people with morals, values, and principles. These gatekeepers ain't nobody. But in this perverted, sick, twisted industry, these gatekeepers do hold access to certain levels, you know? Bro, I've had, <laughs> I've had gatekeepers in the music industry who have literally tried to hold a record deal behind their back and let me know like look if you if you're part of this homosexual act that i'm trying to take part in you hear me yeah come on this door open real quick for you like i i, I got a song where i've talked about that before called the devil's playground and like, this is real dog and the only way that that type of stuff can work on you is if you let them have all the leverage to where you want what's behind that gate that bad so that's, that's a real thing. Um, you also got people who, this is a different type of gatekeeper. The gatekeepers who will say, hey, you making too much righteous noise right now. If you just tone that righteousness down a little bit, then we'll allow you into these doors. But you got to tone that down. You got to become a little more vanilla. You heard me? A little more lukewarm, a little more bland, and you'll fit in with us more. So that's the slick gatekeeping. It ain't telling you, yeah, it ain't telling you to all the way, you know, bend over or, or open your mouth or something like that. It ain't that, but it's telling you like, dim your light. And what ends up happening is you got so many people that's like, well, that's not that bad. They not asking me to do nothing super crazy. I just got to dim my light. 
that's the scariest kind right there. Cause a lot of people will be like, wait, I just got to turn it from level 10 to level five. Man, I bet I could do that, bro. I right, bet now I get accepted. Cool. Next thing you know, you got a whole industry, brother. There's lukewarm, whole industry lukewarm. So then when somebody that's on fire come along, they're looking at it like, whoa, you crazy. Hold on. You, you shining too bright. Hold on, hold on. Chill out, man. You doing, you doing the most. You, you messing up. Man, stop, man. Crazy, man. So I want to backtrack, right? Cause I mean, <laughs> yeah, we definitely got a backtrack, man. So you saying that somebody came up to you personally trying to get you involved into, you know, some homosexual activity. Me personally, I definitely dealt with that, brother. Like I said, I didn't rapped about it and everything. So um, I didn't want the deal that bad. <laughs> yeah. So how did they react when you turned it down? Was they acting funny or? Yeah. Well, you got that moment of truth. When you realize what's happening, you got that moment of truth where you're like, oh, shoot. OK, what am I going to do? And that's not the first time in my life where I've had a moment of truth where I knew, like, my action right now can uh, change the course of my entire life, you know? So I knew what time of, I knew what time of day it was and, you know, I wasn't getting down with it. So when I was like, nah, like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good, you know? This was, at a, this was at a music video shoot. So when I, when I was like, nah, I'm cool, you know, for the rest of the day, it was like, oh, no more attention from this person. You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, this person ain't really willing to meet with you or, or, or talk to you or even like further the idea of talking about working with you. So once you see that you're getting that cold shoulder or once I seen that I was getting that cold shoulder, I was like, well, I won't be getting signed today. You hear me? And you got to keep it moving. But man, it feel good, man. It feel good to be able to to be able to speak about that and be able to speak like to say like, oh, I preserved my manhood. Like it, it feel it feel good. It feel real good. Like that's um that's what you call a, a life defining moment. Yeah, that's wild, man. So when you turned them down, what's they in their feelings? Like what's they trying to block you from doing stuff? Like, yo, we're not gonna allow him to do this or do this or you know, we're not gonna put him on this platform. He's not gonna host this. Like, what happened, yo? I got you. You're asking me, is blackballing a real thing? Yeah. Yes, blackballing is a real thing. Some people in this industry definitely get mad enough at you uh, if you have bruised their ego or if you have um, uh, shown them that you don't need their approval to be successful then they will definitely do what they can to try to blackball you, yes. I don't doubt that people have attempted to blackball me, um, absolutely. But if you don't feed me, if you don't provide my blessings to me, then you can't starve me. You can't deny my blessings to me. And once I truly double down on knowing that like God holds all the keys to whatever's meant for D1, that's when I really started just moving with a level of boldness that's like, yeah, I'm standing on this, you heard me? And you might try to you might try to have a vendetta against me or whatever, 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 but I guarantee I'm gonna exceed anything that you could have did for me. And then I'm gonna look down at you. And you're gonna be like, oh shoot, how you got up there? Cause that's the only one I submit to is up there. You heard me? They got I know they got people that's that's trying to blackball me right now. It, any way, shape, or form that they feel like they could. I know, I absolutely know that, bro. I know it. And for a long time, it's been that way. It's been that way for over a decade. There was somebody, there was somebody in New Orleans who I knew for a fact, uh, who worked in the industry, who was trying to blackball me because I wouldn't sign a deal with them. You know, right when they saw that I was about to get signed to a major label, try to blackball me talked down to me, told me, oh, you ain't gonna never get to this certain level because you trying to do things your own way. Like, man, I done been through all this stuff. And you know, you gotta learn how to respond with love um, and not just love Jesus, but you gotta learn how to love Judas as well. The people who don't rock with you, you know, you gotta be like, hmm, that's how, that, that's how, that's how dope and mature I am. I'm gonna still learn how to love you, but not allow you to you know, be a uh, be a person that's in my on it by hiking up her hymn line when she needed influence rather than researching. I was out in California for 15 years doing my show when she was at a peak and she had a reputation amongst the trial lawyers of being lazy. She just hike her skirt up and try to flirt and uh, 
she wasn't that good in the courtroom, if not pretty bad in the courtroom. So I'm not surprised at what she does. She's 60 years old, and I think listening to her word salad and the way she talks, I think she's got early onset dementia and also some problems with menopausal complications. That's that, you see, today is going to be tomorrow, so since it's gonna to be tomorrow, today we have tomorrow, which is why we are now. Like, what did you say? They have something in mind, but they cannot cognate getting all the way through it, which is why she's famous for this word salad garbage, and she doesn't make a bit of sense. I think since she's only 60, she's actually on a worse track than Biden was. Biden is 20 some years older than her, and he has been senile for a long time. Now about five or six years ago, when did they start ramping up to do this? Uh, 2019, okay, I was saying Biden has been a failure his whole adult career, a second rate, third string player. He's in the game, so he wants to make a name for himself. I considered him for years poor trailer park, urban trailer park trash. And he's a crook. He's a third stringer. Now, what I said he was going to do is he probably wants to claim fame for being the first person to see to it that a woman got to be president. And what I predicted, I'm slightly wrong on it, was that he was going to get in, try to get elected, and if he got one term, try to get elected for a second one. And then halfway through his term, when he had served two years, to retire or resign in her favor. So under the 22nd Amendment, what happens is she can serve for the final two years for somebody and then be elected twice more. So that woman would be able to serve 10 years, second only to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who got elected to four terms before they put the amendment in place so you could. Now, that said, I think and my major at UCLA was political science. My analysis was is they picked the weakest somebody they could as a figurehead, somebody who had some apparent minority status, which she does not. And what goes on is that you get her, everybody that is everybody would be afraid to go against her because of what she can pass herself off as. And then you get somebody that's easy to control because she's lazy, because she is becoming incoherent and because she's always tried to do the casting couch to get where she wants. Now, the problem is, is that will get somebody to a certain level quickly but you can't get past that level if you don't have competence and talent. So my thing about it is, is if I'm crude about it, in this city years ago, I used to represent a whole bunch of pimps and hoes, and I know a hoe when I see one. And I say this, I don't care, women, you do what you want to do if you want to have recreational sex, but when you do the casting couch or anything else for professional purposes to get paid or advance, you a ho and she's old ho and the problem is is what is she supposed to do somebody one of her sycophant slaves comes up and unwraps her in a carpet naked at Putin's feet and he says oh yeah I'm Julius Caesar he said no ho I got better stuff here already plus I don't want you anyway you old woman get on up you know uh, or Xi Jinping, is he supposed to be impressed? She's doing word salad, well, we're here today because China and the U.S. are here today and that's why we have to agree on what we're doing here today. Like, fool, what did you just say? You know, did you say anything? And I've never seen such a salacious mess as I've seen out of her. I think a one West Bank. I had some pretty good properties out in California at one point in time. And I know I had 
three neighbors who had good properties. It was in a place called Ojai, California. And they got caught up about 15, 16 years ago, like a lot of people did in that mortgage bundling scam stuff that was going on. And there was a bank called One West Bank responsible for it, which was owned by George Soros. The Mnuchin that you have out of the Obama administration was Mnuchin, who was the CEO of One West Bank. Well, there were approximately 1,200 counts of indictments returned against Mnuchin in One West Bank in various counties in uh, California. Well, Mnuchin and Soros financed and arranged and sponsored Kamala to run for Attorney General of California. They got her elected. She got in and using the authority she had, she promptly consolidated all 5,200 counts and dismissed them. And a couple of weeks later, Soros sold One West Bank for $4.2 billion. So after that, they got together and got her finance and got everything organized and made the connections for her. And she got elected to U.S. Senator. Uh, Willie Brown made the in initial contacts and arrangements so she could get elected as district attorney for San Francisco. She didn't do a very good job. She had a reputation for giving out the stiffest sentences in the United States of America for simple possession of marijuana in San Francisco, for God's sakes. But it was only to young black men. She's not a parent, never had any children, but she went off on this campaign to lock parents up, some of whom actually were shown to have dropped their children off after, at the school, but they played hooky, so she was putting them in jail. I know my in-laws, now late in-laws, because they're dead, and their fine daughter that I was married to, we were divorced, she got a whole lot of money, but anyway, out of me. What wound up happening was uh, there was a liquor store they like to patronize on the way home. And it was a good liquor store, but it got held up a lot. So Kamala's solution was not go get the crooks, but crow close down the liquor store so nobody would be troubled by it. See, that kind of philosophy, or you've got the serial killer who's got six victims and the families are writing protest letters to her, not hurry up and do something, not, not why you giving the guy such a light deal, is why don't you let this man plead guilty to life without parole instead of delaying it for seven years, trying to make political hay out of it. Uh, I was caught up in a thing where this woman who was supposed to be a financial specialist wound up embezzling a lot, a million and a half from me, about 15 million from some other black celebrities. Uh, and most of it was in the San Francisco area, not LA where I was. She consolidated the cases up there in San Francisco, took five years to resolve it let her plead out not the $15 million of embezzlement, but $35,000. The sentence was five years in the penitentiary, four and a half years suspended, five years probation. The woman wound up sitting on a bench outside Sybil Branch, which is the women's detention facility in L.A. County for five and a half hours. That's all the time she served, made no restitution. And la -di -da, I'm through with it now. I don't care on her behalf. Like, where's our money? You know, what did you do here? You didn't even consult with us. You did this on a surprise basis. That's $15 million gone. What, what happened? It's the kind of thing she would do, see. So it's like that was not a good professional performance. And then she was everybody's favorite Hindu Indian prosecutor and attorney general and senator and now she becomes black but you know i met her daddy a uh, fine gentleman professor harris and the problem with her being black is professor harris says he's caucasian mixed irish and hindu he doesn't have any black ancestors, but his Irish ancestors owned a lot of slaves in Jamaica. 
and had them to work on plantation. Dang, this man got real receipts. So if mama is on the birth certificate listed as a Caucasian, daddy says he's a Ken Caucasian, Caucasian Hindu and has no black ancestors. How did she get to be black? Now, uh, a little side story. When I had my show, let's say this has been 26 years ago, I had two beautiful women that I thought were sisters on the show. And they laughed one time when we all went to a happy hour and said, you think we're black, don't you? Yeah, aren't you? No, we're Hindu. One of them said, my mother's a Hindu Brahmin caste. And my father was Hindu warrior caste. He took an oath to the family to protect her. They fell in love, eloped, and now we got a death warrant on us. We can't go back to India. So, yeah, and then they gave me two books. The guys were Hindu, and they were very dark, but they cut their hair off close, grew beards, and started dressing and acting black, and they got financial aid. One of them, I think, went through medical school that way, masquerading for being black, and somebody else did it. So she went to Howard, and by the way, she told one big lie when she was talking about she got bust because of something Biden did when she was running against him. Well, the yearbook that she put out there that you can still get online from her high school in Canada shows she went from kindergarten through 12th grade in Canada, never went to school in the United States of America. She was born, by the way, in the same hospital that my ex-wife was born in the same 12 month period and my late mother-in-law was in fact a pediatric nurse in that hospital when Kamala was born and the birth certificate that she has is interesting because the confusion comes from a mistake on the birth certificate it lists the mother's race as Caucasian national origin into uh, India and religion Hindu for the father, it does not list national origin. It does not list religion. It does not list anything about that. But where it says race, they put national origin in Jamaica by mistake. Now, if you've ever been to Jamaica and you get over to St. Elizabeth Parish, you see all the high, bright, and white that live in Jamaica. So I've got a good friend retired from law enforcement. He has a white wife, blonde hair, blue eyes, but she was born in Jamaica. Her parents were born in Jamaica. One's blonde and blue eyed. The other one's red haired and gray eyed. And they happen to be related to the King of England because they are aristocrats in England, but they were born in Jamaica. So if you go over there, you see people from Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Kenya, South Africa, you name it. It's part of the British Commonwealth and nobody needed a passport and you could just go in and out. So it's not unusual. You're not black just because you are from Jamaica and they have a whole lot of white people that never left and their ancestors owned a lot of slaves. The Maroons went up into the hill country and got themselves free back in the 1840s, but you know, other than that, it is what it is in Jamaica. So just because you are from that country does not mean you are of the black race. So the problem is, is why don't you go get your daddy to give you an affidavit that you have a black ancestor. And since the only possible claim you have is through your great grandmother, who he says was a Hindu house servant that just happens to be swarthy. Where'd you get your blackness from? See, you're faking it again. And I say this after 50 years of experience, the worst human beings you will ever find are career prosecutors. Something slimy about them. They are so turned off by humanity and everything else. They don't care. They're trying to win the game. It is just play to them. They don't give a damn about the people they represent. They just want to win. So they lie, cheat, steal to win the game. And that brings up the other thing where the Supreme Court of California ordered her to produce the evidence that was exculpating to somebody sitting up on death row that she had hidden. 
they did that over and over and over again with her hiding this evidence. Now, there are exceptions to this rule with career prosecutors, but if you ever want a sleazy somebody, find yourself a career prosecutor who's never done anything else but that until they have moved up. Now, there have been people like Thomas Dewey, who was a career prosecutor. He got uh, Lucky Luciano, the gangster that set up the mob as a syndicate, a business. He got him and became governor of New York and then an unsuccessful candidate for president twice. You have people like that and you got Kamala. Who are we fooling? She ain't winning those elections. The results will be embarrassing. Who was a career prosecutor. And that's essentially all she's done outside of moving directly over into politics. They tend to be crooks. They're not good people. It's like I used to on the bench, it's like, excuse me, can you approach both of you? Do you have any character? Do you realize what you just did? Well, I mean, no, we can't have that. That is not going to be allowed up in here. You do it again and the court's going to see to it that you get a 10 day paid vacation courtesy of the sheriff. No, uh uh. See, and that's what I'm looking at. Um, she wants to be chief administrative officer, but she's never been the boss over anything. She was nominally with the attorney general's office, but you've got all of these egos with all of these people with doctorate of laws who've taken the bar exam and every one of them in there could run against you in an election and be your boss and is as qualified technically as you are to run the place. So she's never been the boss in charge of something where she dictated because what she did in San Francisco and when she got over California is she essentially had somebody else doing it and she was just a political figurehead. So when you come into this situation here, Putin, you know, Russia, Ukraine, those are serious things. They have a lot of nukes. You've got Xi Jinping and China's got one hell of a huge army, Air Force, nukes, computer systems and so on. What is your experience in international diplomacy? You got made the representative of the country to handle the foreign affairs. You failed so badly they yanked you out. When you were actually the boss in charge, the borders are, you just complete abject failure to that. Your only appearance down there was to sit in a chair in the desert while they interviewed you, trying to be cute, flashing your pearls, you know, and you didn't do your job. So you're talking now about you want to legitimize 20 million aliens who've come in here and see that they get fast tracked so they can vote and become part of the whole process. What are you doing? Whose jobs are you taking away? What about the people that actually lined up to go through the rules? You know, I want to become a citizen, so I take the courses. See, nobody's checking. They've got an outbreak of hepatitis. They got an outbreak of measles. HIV is ramped up. They've got all kinds of things. They've got problems with uh, strains of tuberculosis that have no cure. So people are before they come down with it, you have to put them on prophylactics for the rest of their life so they don't get a fatal illness that nobody can cure. So nobody is running the medical test. Nobody is checking to see what penitentiary they got out of. And something that is pretty real is a movie. You remember Al Pacino and Scarface? They dumped all their penitentiaries and they're over here. You got all of these Latino gangs that have now infiltrated. You've got Ukraine, you've got Gaza, You've got people that hate the fact that they don't have technology to shoot down a B-1B bomber. So what do they do? They just walk across the damn border. Nobody's checking them. Somebody is giving them free transportation without even vetting their luggage. And in the luggage, they have military grade explosives, which over the last several years, I'm sure they put in various building structures, hospitals, subways, and everything else 
And on command, they flip the switch and 911 looks like a Boy Scout meeting. So what are you going to do about these things? Nobody's checking. You have a situation right now that has to be taken into context. Just about every major seaport is using these uh, container removal cranes, these giant gantry cranes. They're made in the People's Republic of China. Nobody checked them, and now they went back and did, and there seem to be some things built into them that they can't remove, don't know what the function is, but they appear to be communication devices. What the hell are those? You know? So, you want to shoot down a B-1 bomber 56 miles from the southern border, point where there is a huge illegal crossing, there is a U.S. Air Force base where 24 B-1 bombers stage out of. You can just surround a damn base with some RPGs and take a few of them out. We don't have but 24 of them that are operational and some other was in long-term storage because we can't afford to operate the damn things. What are you supposed to do? That was your job. Did you do it? Did you handle it? No. So, you know, they've got this thing where sometimes they promote people up. You know, you fail at a job, but you got a rep, so they can't get rid of you. So they promote you. Like, for example, Halsey, Admiral Halsey, Bull Halsey, always charged off was aggressive. Great in World War One, World War Two, the first part of it. But there was a thing in the Philippines, well, not Philippines, late a Gulf, it was a disaster. The Japanese laid a decoy force out. He fell for the trap, took off with all of the warships, left the beaches totally unguarded, told nobody, and he should have been court-martialed. But because of his fame, they couldn't, so they wound up promoting him to five-star admiral instead of court-martialing him and canceling him. So, I mean, they do this kind of thing. So, it, it's not unusual. But I'm just saying, hey, if you're going to bring somebody in, bring in somebody that knows what the hell they're doing. Meanwhile, she had a little rally in Georgia. I think 86 people showed up. That was supposed to be interesting. And she had the nerve to call Vance uh, unpatriotic and he came back on a big time he said simplify to serve loyalty I was in the Marine Corps <laughs> over in the sand pile and uh, Trump took a bullet what the hell have you done <laughs> you know and you want to call somebody out on the subject. See, it's hypocrisy. But you see, I did this because I did what I did, and that's what I did, which is because that's why I did it. Hey, what the hell did you just say? Do you realize what you said? Do you know? We'd love to hear what y'all think about this. Don't forget to like and subscribe. So what do you have to say about this comment down your thoughts right now? And make sure to give this video a like and also subscribe to the channel to stay updated in future. Until then, keep exploring.